Stars by the National Association of Scholars. This is number two in our series. We started last time with The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, and now we're doing Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose. Um, which is perhaps not only the great American novel, but also the great American Western novel. Uh, this is, will be, be fun to tease out. Um, so introductions and some details. I'm David Randall, your moderator, director of research, and I've even read the book, which means I'm totally qualified to moderate. Um, we are delighted to have here uh, Matthew Stewart, humanities teacher at the Ambrose School and author of The Most Beautiful Place on Earth, Wallace Stegner in California, and Jen Ladino, professor of English at the University of Idaho, and Richard Etelaine, Professor Emeritus of History and former director of the Center for the American West at the University of New Mexico. A distinguished scholars, more of their works should be visible uh, in the uh, chat bottom button below. And I will just mention, each of the speakers will be speaking for about 12 to 14 minutes. Then there will be a moderated discussion where ideally the discussion is being prompted by your comments, you, the audience. Uh, therefore, please put in questions whenever into either the chat button or the Q&A button. Um, the participants can look down if they're to see if they're getting that stuff. If not them, then please, uh, I will be uh, asked adding moderating comments from you, not in the order given, just in whatever order seems to fit a good conversation. This will be, is being recorded and will be available on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. So look for National Association of Scholars, not NAS, this gets you a wrapper. We do wrap, but this is not probably what you want for this particular uh, episode. And then also any questions that don't get answered, please send them to me, uh, David Randall, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L. -L -L, and um, I will forward them to the panelists afterwards so that they can answer your questions. So that's been uh, a full 14 minutes and however, ever start, I just actually the first two paragraphs just to get everybody into the mood and to know what we'll... now I believe they will leave me alone. Obviously Rodman came up hoping to find evidence of my incompetence, though how an incompetent could have got this place renovated, moved his library up and got himself transported to it without answer arousing the suspicion of his watchful children ought to be a hard one for Rodman to answer. I take some pride in the way I managed all that. And he went away this afternoon without a scrape, scrap of what he would call data. So tonight I can sit here with the tape recorder whirring no more noisily than electrified time and say into the microphone the place and date of a sort of beginning and a sort of return. Zodiac Cottage, Grass Valley, California, April 12th, 1970. And um, now we will go to our speakers. And I believe that was um, Matt Stewart first. Yes, yes. Uh, so thank you to NAS for organizing and thanks to all the panelists. I look forward to our discussion. Um, since I'm going first, I figured I'd uh, give a little uh, synopsis of the plot of the book and just kind of highlight that. And then I have uh, two themes that I find compelling that I was gonna highlight after that. So, um, so to the plot of the book, I think the uh, just recently, thought of a um, good comparison. I think um, Princess Bride actually is a uh, interesting link for the, the structure of the book in that we have both the um, story of the storytellers uh, in the book and then a story of the, uh, the story that's actually being told. So, um, so uh, as David just introduced, Oliver, or, or sorry, uh, Lyman Ward is a historian um, in Grass Valley, California, and he's the storyteller. Uh, we'll, we find that um, the listener of the story is, uh, is a woman named Shelley Rasmussen, who is uh, um, the daughter of his neighbors. And um, so we, we hear the story of Lyman and Shelley working through a project together. And that project is the, is the story itself of Oliver and Susan Ward. So um, these are uh, Lyman's grandparents and Oliver um, is a mining engineer who is uh, 
attempting to build infrastructure for the modern or for well turn of the century west their uh, primary um, focus of the story is the 1870s to 1890s or so um, so oliver is uh working on building infrastructure in the west irrigation uh mining technologies um he is married to susan ward who is uh who's the primary lens through which we, we receive their story. Um, um, so she writes a series of letters with her good friend, um, Augusta, and uh, these are what Olive, or sorry, what Lyman is exploring as historical research at his cottage. And so um, a few crucial points about Lyman though, is that he has uh, just um, experienced several tragedies. So he is, uh, he has a bone disease that has resulted in the amputation of his leg and he is, um, he is confined to a wheelchair, limited range of motion in his joints. And uh, so he is, that's one tragedy. And then the second tragedy is that the, uh, the doctor who operated on his leg has uh, um, recently run off with his wife. So he's just also recently divorced and in a um, fairly humiliating way. So, um, so one of the big questions for his story is how, how will he reckon with this uh, personal calamity that he's just experienced? And um, we see that work, uh, worked out in his conversations with Shelley. And so um, one big story for the, the wards that he's researching is, is that, um, uh, that Susan is, um, she is considering herself more of a tourist in the West at first, she is, uh, she is interested in the West as experiences to relay back to her fellow Eastern writers and artists. Um, she'll eventually kind of settle herself in the West, but um, more or less think of herself as in, in permanent exile in the West. But Oliver is uh, very excited about the, the prospect of living in the West and considers himself a real Westerner. And uh, so we're kind of looking at how those two contrasting visions of their life together uh, will be reconciled and, and what will happen with these two, with this conflict that they're reckoning with. So um, two points about the book that I find very compelling and interesting. Um, so the first one is uh, the issue of place as inheritance and place as bequest. And so uh, people that are familiar with Stegner's story, I, I need to backtrack a bit here to give you a brief uh, version of his biography um, to, to, to give a sense of why Angle Repose is uh, such an interesting uh, riff on this theme. So um, Stegner was born in 1909, uh, and he was born to a, uh, his father is what he later called in his essays, a classic boomer. So he was uh, chased various booms throughout the West, um, tried to grow wheat to feed the armies of Europe during the Great War, then tried to run alcohol through Salt Lake City during Prohibition. Of course, gold was in the mix at some point. Um, so he is a classic boom chasing uh, Western dreamer um, who's married to Wallace Stegner's mother. Hilda was, a, uh, was what he would call a nester or a sticker, someone who who wanted to settle in one of these towns and experience the joys and pleasures of place and, and uh, settled habits and long acquaintances and things like that. So, um, so Stegner's father, George, tended, well, he did win um, all of these decisions. And so they were dragged across the whole West um, chasing whatever boom he happened to be fascinated with at that moment. Um, and, and then, so that's, that's basically Stegner's childhood is being dragged across these Western towns. He was much more sympathetic to his mother. So anyway, um, by, by 1939 though, so um, in Stegner's, by the time he's just around 30, um, his whole family had actually died. So a series of tragedies through the 1930s, his brother dies first, then his mother, then his father. And so by the age of 30, Basically, Stegner is is sitting alone. Well, not he's he's married by that point, but he is uh, he is without a personal and possessed past, which is a phrase that he used. So he he is kind of an orphan in a present that he has no connection to. No, he's inherited nothing. There is a, uh, a poignant vignette in um, 
his autobiographical novel, Big Rock Candy Mountain, where he gets a, a shaving mug. That's about what he's inherited. And I think that's pretty close to the truth. So um, Stegner wrote several books about that theme, uh, about not receiving a place or a, a, a past. Um, Angle Repose is kind of a new take on the topic because he um, is exploring the story of someone who does have very much have a, a possessed past. So the Lyman is an historian. Um, he's also the inheritor of a, a beautiful home. Uh, we, it's a Zodiac College in the book, but um, close parallel to North Star House, which was built by a famous architect named Julia Morgan. Um, so it's a beautiful place. He's got a, a beautiful inheritance in that sense. And then he's also uh, has a great deal of respect for his grandparents, which is evident throughout the book. So he's got both a familial past and a material past that he is actually exploring, living in. He's also an historian, so he has a deep sense of the past and on multiple levels. Um, so, so it's an interesting twist on that theme. But uh, what, what's what I find particularly poignant about Angle of Repose is that um, we see Lyman um, trying to reckon with this past that he's received. But then um, what, what his problem is, is not the fact that he has no past, but that he has no one to pass on this inheritance to. So he has, he is, he's kind of bereft of, of someone to give this, this uh, what he is, you may, maybe you can consider the steward of, give this on to. So his, his son is a sociologist, um, kind of uh, more like comic relief throughout the book. He, he has no real deep connection to his son. Um, his son kind of looks on his historical work as just antiquarian hobby or, you know, kind of wishes he would just study someone interesting like Wild Bill Hickok or something like that. <laughs> and so he has no real sympathy for um, the deepest things that his father cares about. So, so he doesn't really have a familial uh, connection to his future um, you know he's kind of off in the off alone in the in the zodiac college uh, he and then um, one of the things that uh, kind of develops over the course of the book is that this the person that he actually does seem to have a connection to is Shelley who um, you know she she's one of the first people to really take an interest in his in the, in the work that he's doing and in him and they and they have kind of this uh, strange, relationship that develops over the course of the book. And so he, he finds himself, this is the person that is, that cares about what I, what I care about. Uh, perhaps I can give this to her, you know? Um, and, and it's, and it's kind of sad in the sense that, you know, he's, he has a family connection to her. Her mother has been a, so is his caretaker. And, and um, so there's, there's something of a connection, but his immediate acquaintance with Shelly is, is only a few months long. And, um, and it's, it's just a fairly uh, loose friendship, really. Um, so we kind of see, so I see that it's a very poignant moment where he's just, what, what, where can I put all this effort that's gone into me, into my place, and, you know, all my learning that I've achieved, you know, um, where can I put it? So um, I think there's this sense in which, you know, he's uh, looking at his life and taking stock and saying, I there's so much here that I'd like to give on and, I, and, and no one's, no one seems to be interested. So um, what is it that he actually wants to give on? So this is basically my second point is that uh, uh, two things. Um, one, I would say uh, Lyman, one of the things that I find interesting about Lyman is that you can kind of see, you know, the book was written in 1971, see a little bit of a forecast of the crisis of the humanities here. So he, he, um, He's clearly a believer in the, the value of art and literature and, and the, the, you know, you use the word wisdom, what can be acquired from those pursuits. So he's not, they're not just um, vehicles for something else. They, you know, he has spent his life immersed in study and he wants to, you know, pass on the study to people that will value it. So um, I have a, one section from the book that I was planning to read for this point here just a, kind of a, a sense of both themes, but also you can see um, how his study of art and literature has is, is, uh, influenced him. So he's here he is talking about Susan um, leaving one of their homes. So it says, gone and as painful now as the thoughts of a stillborn child, 
Sentimental, of course, riddled with Anglo-American mawkishness about home, quicksandy with assumptions about monogamy and woman's highest role, buttery with echoes of the household poets, all that. But I find that I don't mind her emotions and her sentiments. Home is a notion that only the nations of the homeless fully appreciate and only the uprooted comprehend. What else could one plant in a wilderness or on a frontier? What loss would hurt more? So I don't snicker backward 90 years at poor grandmother pacing her porch and biting her knuckle and hating the loss of what she had never quite got thinking, uh, got over thinking as her exile. I find her moving. She is Masaccio's Eve, more desolate than Adam because he can invent the bow and arrow and the spear, but she can only try to reassemble outside Eden an imperfect copy of what she has lost. And so you just kind of see the, the, the fact that this painting is what helps him make sense out of his grandmother's situation, the, the Masaccio painting of Adam and Eve. You know, this is kind of a theme throughout the book as he brings poetry to mind, paintings to mind. These are things that help him make sense out of the world and live a a life that he finds more fulfilling. Um, so another another thing that I think Lyman wants to pass on is just the uh, the value and fragility of home, and uh, we see this primarily in Susan's uh, Susan's responses to her time in the West. Um, but I, I've got two more brief passages to read uh, that I think illustrate well this theme. So uh, first one is, uh, is a conversation between Lyman and Shelley where uh, um, they're discussing her recent hitchhiking efforts with her uh, boyfriend slash uh, for her family only husband. Um, and here's what Shelley says. This is, uh, <laughs> I always kind of find this a fairly amusing um, throwing of Shelley under the bus for what has Stegner has her say in this conversation. But anyway, I think it illustrates the point. So um, I suppose Shelley said, I guess I don't understand this home business of hers either. She was not only a culture hound, she's got a terrible property consciousness. And this is Shelley talking about Susan. What would be the matter with traveling around? When Larry and I were hitching, I loved it. That gypsy hobo life, that's it. I know a pair who hitchhiked all, all the way from Singapore to London. I'd like to do that. I don't dig these homebodies. Times change, Lyman says, not without irony. Why didn't you and your husband stay on the road if it was so great? Shelley was at her knuckle again, slurp. Sidelong flash of eyes. He's not my husband, of course. That's for family only. All right, I said, the man you travel with then. Why aren't you still traveling? She threw her hands up in the air and leaned back, stretched, arching her chest upward on Boston halter again. Yuck. It did get a little hairy sleeping in the washrooms of Canadian tourist parks in the rain, but I'd do it again. I mean, you're never that free again. And so it's kind of the, the irony of her being never that free again, but living in uh, tourist parks with uh, sleeping in the washrooms is kind of funny uh, riff on a lack of home. But um, him, uh, Lyman then is thinking about this, this issue and how Western history has repeated itself and the people just chasing booms, chasing the next big thing, not really ever settling. And he's thinking about this in contrast with uh, Susan and her sensibilities about home. And so here's one of the uh, things that he writes in, that, in the aftermath of that conversation. So when frontier historians theorize about the uprooted, the lawless, the purseless and socially cut off who settled the West, they're not talking about people like my grandmother. So much that was cherished and loved, women like her had to give up. And the more they gave it up, the more they carried it helplessly with them. It was a process like ionization. What was subtracted from one pole was added to the other. For that sort of pioneer, the West was not a new country being created, but an old one being reproduced. In that sense, our pioneer women were always more realistic than our pioneer men. The moderns, carrying little baggage of the kind that Shelley called merely cultural, not even living in traditional air, but breathing into their space almost a scientific mixture of synthetic gases and polluted at that, are the true pioneers. Their circuitry seems to include no atavistic domestic sentiment. They have suffered empathetic, empathectomy. Their computers hum no ghostly feedback of home sweet home. How marvelously free they are how unutterably deprived, 
And so I think uh, what Lyman is attempting to say is that, you know, home is fragile. It takes a lot of work to build. And he is just uh, disappointed to see so much of that being cast off by the generation that he is observing in the 19, uh, late 60s, early 70s. So that is uh, points I have to share for now and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you so very much. And I believe that our next person is going to be Professor Ladino. Professor Ladino? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, it's um, amazing to be here. It's my pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, thanks for having me. And I, I really enjoyed that kind of overview, Matt, of the, the, the plot of the book and the comparison to The Princess Bride, but more importantly, some of the thematic issues, especially the focus on home, which is something I'm um, especially excited to hear you all talk about and to field questions about. Um, but first, you know, this is a book I've loved for a long time, but not that long. I'm gonna start with a bit of a confession here, which is that I came to read Wallace Stegner pretty late in my life. I grew up on the East Coast. I'm from Northern Virginia originally. Um, so I'm a Western, I'm a transplant to the West like Susan. Um, and even though I was an English major, I went to the University of Virginia. I had never read or heard of Wallace Stegner until I moved to Wyoming at age 20 after I graduated from college. So I was a latecomer to um, Stegner's work, but I came to really appreciate it very quickly um, for various reasons, which I'll tell you about. My comments are gonna focus on um, both my own personal relationship to Stegner, but also kind of some big picture questions. What makes this a great American novel? What does Stegner teach us that's unique about the sense of place and our relationship to history? And then why is this novel still relevant today? Which is another thing I'd love to hear some audience perspectives on too. Um, so my husband introduced me to Stegner when I was a grad student and I was aspiring to be a college professor one day, which I've succeeded in doing. I mean, he gave me a copy of Crossing to Safety, which I think is still my favorite Stegner novel. I'm not sure if others have read that one or not, um, although it doesn't have the same epic historical nature as this, but it really does show off his ability to write well about relationships, about family, about friendships, about growing older, and about the ways that we are individuals in a society that change over time. And we're always struggling to figure out who we are in relationship to our past. So as a Western transplant, I um, am working for the National Park Service. You know, I was quickly introduced to Stegner's nonfiction as well. Um, his wilderness letter, of course, is hugely important for environmentalism and for public lands preservation. And that's been important to me. And I always like to correct people who misattribute the America's best idea line to Ken Burns, which ha happens a lot, um, but it's Stegner's. Uh, that was his phrase that national parks are America's best idea. They show us as uh, who we are at our best as a country, right? I'm paraphrasing that last bit, but um, I've, I teach his um, nonfiction essays quite a bit in my seminars on Western American literature. And I've never um, endeavored to teach this 569 page novel to my students, although there's much to recommend it. Um, of course, the Pulitzer Prize or Pulitzer Prize certifies this as a masterpiece. And I think to me that suggests a kind of lasting, enduring relevance, something that is both um, kind of timeless in a sense, but also captures something about the moment in which it's written, that contemporary, contemporaneous moment when, when the story is set. And I think Matt's comments about the sort of 60s and 70s counterculture and the way that Shelley is kind of held up as this figure of mockery um, is part of that. But neither Stegner nor Lyman thought very highly of, of many of the, the beliefs of the counterculture, that's no secret. Um, but so part of what makes this book, I think a great American novel is that it is this kind of epic and that it's ambitious in scale and its historical breadth, but also that it refracts our past through a very particular present moment that's also really compellingly laid out for us. Um, so I think it's brilliant as a story at at least three different scales, right? You've got the personal family story. This is Lyman trying to make sense of who he is in relationship to his own family, his own ancestors. It's also a story about the West as a region, and it's also a story about the nation. Um, and so I think a great American novel is one that develops a, a compelling cast of characters like the Princess Bride, um, but also teaches us something about what it means to be Americans, right? What we have in common. This is something I talk about a lot with my students. You know, how does a country as large and diverse as ours um, hold itself together? What connects us? Um, so I, as a new assistant professor, not long out of grad school, I wrote an article about this novel that starts with a debate my husband and I had over the book and about Stegner's sort of godlike status in Western American literary studies. 
Um, and my critique had to do with um, what I saw at the time as some sort of overly simplified understandings of the frontier, a kind of nostalgia for a particular version of Western settlement, even while I feel like Stegner aims really um, uh, powerfully to sort of critique and, and demystify certain elements of that frontier. So it's a really interesting nuanced picture of a kind of gritty realism of Western settlement that, um, again, I think we could talk more about. I'd be happy to um, rehash the debate I had with my husband over this book at the time. But, you know, when you, you've set an author up to be this sort of um, untouchable figure, it becomes hard to, to read against the grain of the novel. And I was sort of challenging myself to do that as a young scholar. Um, although, again, another feature of a great American novel is that when you revisit it, it rewards rereadings. You might see it with fresh eyes at a different stage in your life. So I feel um, a little unsettled or not, I don't change my mind about anything I published, but it's, you know, every time you see something and you wrote 10, 12 years ago, it feels like a different person wrote that. So I appreciate the way that the novel lends itself to different takes, depending on where you are in your life. Um, I, um, as an American studies professor, I think it's really interesting um, to think about this phrase, great American novel and what it might um, historically have, have done, which is it can be a little bit exclusive. And I think we've moved away from that. And Matt mentioned the crisis in the humanities. And, and I think that's an interesting way to think about this book um, and Lyman's relationship to that, that culture of 50 years ago, the 60s and 70s this is 50 years old now as of this year, right? So um, what's going on there that might be um, representative of our current moment? You know, I would say looking at the list of the Pulitzer Prize winners, um, including Idaho's um, Anthony Doerr's All the Light We Cannot See, which is a novel that I just totally love, as well as Richard Powers' The Overstory, another favorite. We also see two winners by um, Colson Whitehead, who's reckoning with the legacy of slavery, which I think is as important to our national history and identity as the frontier history is, right? So we have all this rich and diverse, you know, legacy um, as a country that I think literature still helps us to reckon with and to understand in ways that are super powerful. Um, so I would say, you know, as an American studies professor, I take a sort of big tent approach to thinking about American literature and what counts as a great American novel. Stegner's voice would certainly be in my tent. Um, so would Colson Whitehead's, so would Juno Diaz's, so would Toni Morrison's, right? There's a wide range of, of um, voices that I think need to be included to tell this sort of great American story, right? Which is a complicated one. Um, so Stegner, I think is really unique and special when it comes to writing about place and history. Um, if you haven't read The Sense of Place essay, that's you know just a gold standard in terms of understanding, I think what Matt was getting at with this tension between setting down roots um, in a place and really making it home. Um, part of that is storytelling and memory and having poets. <laughs> so shout out to any poets in the audience, you're included in Stegner's definition of what makes a place a place. Um, and I think we do, we do see this happening in the novel, right? Susan is both homesick for the East and for her friends there. So she's got this nostalgic um, relationship to her past and to the East, but she's very committed to making a go of it and making a home in the West. Um, I can connect with that a little bit, as I said, um, as a Virginian by birth, who never really felt at home on the East Coast. And when I moved to Wyoming, I fell totally in love with the landscape and the people. And I just felt like I was in the right place for the first time. You know, something about the pace of the conversation and the easygoing people and the love of outdoor recreation and the sheer sort of scale of, you know, I was in Grand Teton National Park, which is hard not to fall in love with. Um, but Stegner is great at capturing how this region of the West is defined by certain variables, whether it's dryness, you know, aridity, or a place that teaches you to see scale differently. He writes about that as well. Um, that scalar contrast, that sense of bigness is something I think we see in Angle of Repose and a lot of Stegner's nonfiction as well. And that there's a kind of humility that goes along with that. Um, I keep coming back to the last lines of the novel and if we have time, we can maybe turn to those later, but I feel like Lyman is, is learning a kind of humility. His last line is, I lie wondering if I am man enough to be a bigger man than my grandfather. He's wondering if he's gonna finally call for help. He's, you know, needs care, constant care and his, former wife and his son are trying to get him to go into sort of a nursing home facility, which he doesn't want to do. Um, but he's, he's trying to challenge himself to ask for help. And so I think that's a kind of humility that, um, oops, is, uh, yeah, really important. Sorry, I was getting a Zoom message that I'm signed out, but I'm still here, right? 
Okay. All right. Good. Um, so uh, what else? I mean, I think along those same lines, I think Stegner's writing in this book in particular um, challenges the kind of individualism that we see as part of the frontier story, right? And he reminds us in, in several places in this book that the federal government helped to incentivize and subsidize um, Western settlement. It was not um, this sort of region that was all on its own out here without that, um, that financial contribution, or some would say, you know, oversight in a negative way. Um, so there's some interesting tension there. Um, and I, I think that the novel does an excellent job of populating the West with what Stegner says are real people, you know, and Lyman's like my parents, my grandparents rather were people. And Stegner has written elsewhere that people in the West were quote, infrequently cowboys and never myths, right? He wants people to be flesh and blood human beings with real stories and real um, feelings about that. Um, so I think, again, the West is kind of um, a uniquely, um, a unique region in that it's tied more closely than certain other regions are to national identity, to what makes us American. And there is a kind of nostalgia that has always gone along with that, that development of the West, the sense of the closing of the frontier and the end of Western settlement, um, as well as a kind of paradoxical forward-looking hope for the future. Stegner's own phrase, the geography of hope, is one that scholars like to think about a lot. Um, Lyman is struggling as a historian with, um, and a disabled person who has a, an amputated leg, um, which is a kind of heavy handed symbol of being cut off from the past. He makes that connection for us um, in, in the book that you know, as an amputated person, I am cut off from the past the way most Americans are. And so he's trying to establish a continuity between past and present and, and to look ahead into the future. And I find that really interesting because Americans are um, notoriously bad at history and geography, I think, from a, from a global standpoint, we're often too forward looking for our own good. And so this impulse to take a moment and kind of look backward is I think a really important one um, now as it was you know, 50 years ago. Um, Lyman also says it's kind of an escapist one. He wants to kind of elude some of the struggles he's dealing with in his own present. Um, so I think he's looking for a sense of history that's not totally nostalgic, but not naively optimistic either. So a kind of interesting relationship to the past. I also think, you know, because this is partly an epistolary novel, he's collecting, he's got letters, right? That his grandmother has written, not to her husband. There's no letters. I find this really interesting between the two of them that have made it um, into his hands, but letters to her, her friend Augusta back East and, or mostly what we have. And so he's cobbling together this version of his family's story and the nation's story from these fragments, from these texts that are all he has available to him. Letters, some photos and some drawings. Um, and he admits you know, to filling in the gaps in the record when he has to. So it's a reminder to me that history isn't this neat sort of objective thing that we just read or, or access in some simple way, but we have to sort of create it through um, multiple different perspectives and stories and kind of piece it together. Okay, so the last thing I'm just gonna quickly mention is why do I think this is still relevant? And again, this is an open conversation. I hope we'll have more in the Q and A. Um, as Matt was saying, I think making a home and sort of thinking about home as inheritance versus something that we create is something that's really, I think, profound. You know, as, as more people are struggling with loneliness, despite all of our many ways of being connected online and all of these different devices and social media um, environments that people use, there's a kind of loneliness epidemic. And so I think Stegner's willingness to um, kind of celebrate these families and communities that really put the work in to cultivate relationships, to build homes together, to nurture that sense of place, to really take care of each other. I think that's all really valuable um, today, just in terms of modeling um, those communities. You know, our contemporary political polarization, I think speaks to a need for novels like this that can challenge us to kind of think about what, as I said before, what brings us together as a country, right? We share a past, how do we reconcile and make sense of that past um, and, and what connects us today? I think these are ongoing questions that we should really be talking about. Um, Stegner um, acknowledged what he called an Anglo-centered bias in his own work. I can't, I don't have the quote, that is the quote, but I don't have the citation at my fingertips. I can find it if you'd like. I cite it in my, my article from uh, 2009. Um, and I think we still see that in, in sort of representations of regions in popular culture and, and news and things. A lot of people are thinking that rural communities in particular in the West and the South are mostly white, but they aren't really um, demographically, they're not often. Um, and so I think the lessons that the book teaches us about how diverse and complex the country is, 
and that we are this really strange <laughs> mix of very, very different states and regions are, are quite, quite valuable, right? And again, thinking about whose place um, this is, who, what kind of place we're inheriting, what kind of place we wanna create is important. And it reminds me of, I think my favorite thing that these last lines I just read to you make me think about is this question of, um, you know, how do we connect to our own ancestors? And then what kind of ancestors do we wanna be for future generations, right? For our own children, our own grandchildren, um, the people that are gonna in inherit our own, uh, the place that we're building today. So these final lines that Lyman says, they resonate with a lot of what I hear indigenous writers and scholars talking about. Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, I don't know if anyone's read Braiding Sweetgrass, a beautiful book of essays. She challenges us to think about this. What kind of ancestor do you want to be, right? And so it helps me to think about my identity as this kind of um, something in a line of continuity, right? With my own ancestors doing what they did. Sometimes those things were flawed needing to reconcile and sort of reckon with those things, but also to do better and to be the kind of ancestor that I wanna be and pass down the kind of world that I wanna pass down to people that are gonna inherit it after me. And I think books like Angle of Repose um, are really uh, brilliant at getting us to think about that. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Um, and I will have us go on next to uh, Professor Richard Etulane uh, as our third speaker, Professor Etulane. I first met uh, eh, Wallace Stigner in graduate school, and I was attracted to him because he was uh, middle of the road. He was between English and history, and my master's was in English, American literature, PhD was American history and literature. So I was attracted as a graduate student interested in literary history because Wallace Stigner could give me a model to follow. So I began to follow him a great deal. And when I came back to Idaho, uh, uh, and found out about Stegner and the later things that he was doing, I was especially attracted to, of course, Angle of Repose. And uh, so uh, uh, soon after Angle of Repose came out and he won the Pulitzer with it, he came to speak at Logan, Utah, and he was the chief speaker. And uh, I went to him and said, Mr. Stegner, uh, could you sign my uh, Angle of Repose? And, uh, he kind of opened it up a little bit and I had a lot of marks uh, underneath lots of things because there was so much Idaho in there and he signed it. And just before that, he had uh, written an introduction to a collection of conversations with another Western writer. So after meeting him and he was very nice to me, I wrote him a, a letter and said, would you be interested in a book of conversations? Uh, like, and I referred to the book that he had written the introduction for. He said, well, let me think about it. And I'm sure he wanted to find out what that ball-headed Basque was going to do and what had he done. And after that, we uh, made an agreement and we did a book of conversations. He treated me like a literary son. And at that point, I think maybe it might have happened because he and his son were sort of at odds, his son being a little bit of the people that he's criticizing in Angle of Repose. So I went to him and we did that book. And uh, uh, I've been thinking about the relationship of Stegner and Angle of Repose for a long, long time. So let me start by giving you about five reasons, I think, that Angle of Repose should be considered a, a great American novel. And then I'll, I'll dig into about two or three of them. First of all, Angler Pose is a first-rate work of history. And because I'm a historian, I'm going to put, you, put the book into historiography so you see how it broke new ground. And it was a wonderful work of historiography in two ways, in its east-west relationships and its past and present in dealing with Western history. Secondly, it's a book of premier characterization. And of course, I, I would just use two. I'll just say Susan Burling Ward and, and her grandfather, Lyman Ward, as examples. But you've already been quoting with uh, the younger people that are involved in the story, too. Number three, it's a wonderful book of organization. And some of you, Matt, talked about a story within a story. Well, what I thought about was uh, Mark Twain's uh, celebrated Jumping Frog in Calaveras County, where in fact you have a storyteller telling a, a story. And so not all people are able to do that. And Stigner thought that was very important in what he had to do. And I agree with him. Um, 
It's also a, st a story of eye catching descriptions of both the East and the West, especially the West. And uh, because I know some of those places, he was marvelous at being able to catch the descriptions. And finally, it's a book revealing about the 1960s, about the counterculture and about Stigner's um, mixed blessings or uh, darts that he wanted to throw uh, against the 1960s. Uh, I'll just quote one at, right now. He said to me, I don't know why when you're angry at Mr. Jones, you want to break Mrs. Mr. Smith's windows. And what he meant by that is people upset with the Vietnam War came marching into his classes at, at Stanford and protested and broke up the class. And that was alienating to Stegner. Well, let's deal with the history part. I'm not sure how many of the people uh, who are listening know this, but this was a book that broke with the predominant points of view on how we interpreted the American West. We had done what we call the Turnerian interpretations. It was still in line in the 1960s. When I was in graduate school in the early 1960s, we were still following Turner. This book comes out in 1971. There were a few people who had said a few things about uh, a post-Turner point of view. This is a novel that was ahead of most historians in what it had to say. It's a cross-continental book. In other words, it's going to deal with East and West. Almost all major interpretations of the West up until this time talked about Eastern people who came to the West, but the focus was on the West. There wasn't a, a, an emphasis on what Easterners brought to the West. It's what Easterners saw in the West, people and uh, landscapes that were different. Stegner saw that as different. And it's very important that we see that because that's, of course, Susan's story. And Susan is at the center of that, showing us how important it is to understand the East in the, into the West. You know, I think when he says it this way, and this is Lyman Ward speaking, I'm impressed with how much of my grandparents' life depended on continuities, contacts, connections, friendships, and blood relationships. And then he really zeroes in. Lyman adds, contrary to the myth, the West was not made entirely by pioneers who threw away everything but an ax or a gun. That is not the Turnerian interpretation. He's moving away from the Turnerian interpretation. That's breaking with what the predominant point of view was up till that time. That was brand new. Now, Stegner wasn't the first but imagine this is a novel. This is not a work of historiography, but it is a work of historiography. And it's very important to see it. That's the first really important part of history. The second is the relationship between the past and the present. Here again, there's a ternary interpretation. No book overview was written about the West until the 1970s that came into the 20th century. So think about that. That means when Turner said the West ended with the frontier in 1890, that means that they were still thinking those terms in historiography in the early part of the 1960s. Stegner is telling us we need to pay attention to the continuities and to the changes that occurred between the West of the 19th century and the West of the 20th century. I find it very interesting that there's a generation left out in this story, the parents. You know, here's grandparents and here's grandson or granddaughter or granddaughter, grandmother and grandson. But what happened to the parents in between? It's left out, but it is a remarkable movement then from, from the past to the present in dealing with that. Now, what Lyman Ward again tells us a very interesting point. He said, I would like to talk to somebody about my grandparents, that is Susan Burling Ward and her husband Oliver, their past and their part in the West becoming, their struggle toward ambiguous ends. Now, what he's again talking about is how their past marches into the present. And I think it's very important. This linkage, this series of ties between East and West, between past and present, I think are the most important reason. It's a global book. 
it's a transcontinental book. And it was something really new in the way we looked at American history. And Stegner did not want to be known as a Western writer. You know why? Because if you were a Western writer, you were a Zane Gray. So when I heard him say that, I said, but Wally, aren't you a regional writer in the same way that Robert Frost is a New England writer or William Faulkner is a Southern writer? They're both regions. Oh yes, in that way I am. But what he meant by that is you got dismissed as a writer, a Western writer. And what he shows us is a Western writer is kind of universal or a continental wide. And I think that's really, really important for us to see. So the countercultural characters that gather around Lyman show you some of the disruptions from the past to the present. One of the conflicts, and certainly I think Lyman is speaking for Segner when he says this, the trouble with the counterculture is they don't know the past. You know, they don't even, they don't even know uh, uh, about Brook Farm. They don't know when, when the uh, young guy is going to go out and start a, a new Eden. He doesn't know about the successes and mainly failures of Brook Farm or some of these others. And what Stegner is saying is, if you're not going to understand the past, you're probably going to be blind a lot about the future. It's a very important lesson, I think, for us. So he says about that Berkeley generation, they're without a sense of history. To them, it's only aborted social science. And he adds, and I like this very much, I believe in time as they, his ancestors did, and in life chronological rather than life existential. And there he is, of course, preaching uh, the very important points. So those two very important points of history, I think are at the central center. And if they're learned from, you're going to maybe reach an angle of repose. The key to getting to an angle of repose is to understand the relationships between East and West and past and present. And by the way, there's a second thing we haven't mentioned yet. It's called the Doppler effect. And if I can make the noise, it starts. And as he's lying there in bed at the end, he hears the cars come, they reach an apex, and then they kind of coast off. And it's, it's almost like the peak of learning. If you go from the past to the present and you reach that apex of the Doppler effect, you will maybe arrive at an angle of repose. And I think it's very important. Well, it's also, of course, a novel of character, of characters. Uh, Stegner tied this to marriage. When I ask him, what is this book about? I think you would be uh, interested. He said, Angle of Repose is a book about marriage. And when I asked him about why was he so interested in the marriage stories, and he said, oh, there were so many of his colleagues whose marriages were breaking up. And if you remember one of his previous novels, uh, there's a sort of counterculture guy that comes and lives at the bottom of the place where Stegner's home was and how the, the relationships are so scattered. So he was very, very interested in that. And it, I think part of it has to do with how solid a marriage he had and how tension ridden it, the marriage was of his parents. There's no question that Stegner had two heroines in life. One was his mother and one was his wife. And those two women made a great deal of difference in his life. I think he was really interested in this book in giving us an example of that East to West, but through a woman's perspective. Now, granted the sources that he had and that he used gave him that perspective, but I think he was really interested in that too. I don't have any numbers and I can't prove what I say next, but I think Stegner appealed more to women writers, to readers than he did to men writers. I don't mean by that, that male writer, readers didn't care for him. I think he had always, in all of his books, had an appeal to, to women writers. He was able to depict women people as very, very interesting. In other words, he's moving away from the John Wayne, you know, Wild Bill, Billy the Kid kind of West. And so many Western men still were hanging on to that. 
and he was saying the West was more complex than that. So I think it's important then to realize it's a, a book of, of, uh, of character. And Susan is a student. I, I like this. She's a student. And she's so different from what the frontier romance stories were. They were always the second class kind of characters in the Zane Grey. They were the people who reacted to. In this story, Susan is at the top of the story. And she's very, very important. And she's learning. Uh, a friend of mine picked up a copy of Angle Repose and somebody else previously had, had read it and didn't like Susan very well. And uh, I've always said there's some snobbishness in Susan. If you've read any of the letters, Susan uh, could be very snobbish in what she had to say. Mary Hallett Foote could be snobbish about the Boise women. They just weren't up to par. This person who had read it and got to those sections where S Susan is in Boise and he wrote snot, <laughs> S-N-O-T <laughs> in the margin. <laughs> well, there was some of that in Susan and she had to, had to make her way through the realization that West wasn't exactly what she thought, that it wasn't all outback. So there was some things there that she had to learn. And she's kind of pushed in that direction. She's pulled in that direction. She doesn't march so much in that direction, but she's learning a history. And I think it's very, very important. Well, that second character is really important is Lyman too. How much, how much is Lyman Stegner? That's very, very interesting. I, I find a lot of Stegner in, in, in Lyman. Uh, I think especially in his reaction to the counterculture, I think Lyman, uh, Stegner was a little bit that way. Uh, one of the reasons, again, I can't prove that one of the reasons he retired early from Stanford, and by the way, he was a very popular teacher at Stanford. Not only maybe if you know Ken Kesey and Larry McMurtry and uh, Barry's uh, teacher, but he had a huge survey of American literature, had over a hundred students in it, semester by semester, but he retired early. And I think part of it was in the end of the 60s, and by the way, he got a nice contract for five books too, so that helped a lot. Uh, but part of the reason he left is he felt increasingly out of touch with what was happening. Um, here's a, a perspective from Lyman, I think that comes really from Stegner. Lyman puts it this way. Every fourth rate antiquarian in the West has panned Lola Montez, famous uh, performer in the West, has panned Lola Montez's poor little gravel. My grandparents are in a deep vein that was never been dug. They were people. Uh, and we, we heard that and that's important. And, and what he was saying is some things that are really important for understanding what Lyman. Stegner told me he was as much interested in the tensions and balances of marriage as any other subject. So history, history from East to West, history from past to present in marriages and uh, I like this one. He said he was interested in a Willa Cather story. And by the way, I put Stegner along with Willa Cather and John Steinbeck as the three great recent maybe writers of the West in the last century. Uh, he said, Willa Cather was trying to use a rope in a story to tie the house to the barn. So that, in other words, this is all metaphorical. So that in the days of storm, you could find your way from the house to the barn. And he said, in angled repose, I'm trying to do the same thing. And I think that's very important to see that as a relationship between the, the past and the present. So here are some of the lessons that we should learn, I think, uh, answers to the large questions. If you scratch a Western, Westerner deeply, you'll find an Easterner made over, sometimes partially and sometimes reluctantly. Put Susan's name right after the reluctantly. There are two angles of repose in the West, East and West and past and present. And it's not a Western novel. It's not a popular Zane Grey. So he was making very clear what a Western novel could be. It, it's the voices of two people. It's a woman's novel. And then I like this, what he says here about the 1960s. This is Stegner's reluctance on reformers. I am not at all sure about reformers. It does seem to me when reformers 
set out to remake the world, somebody has to say, now this is Stegner himself speaking, are you the person designed for this? Do you have the wisdom and the experience and the sense of history, the courage, the persistence, and the rest of it that it would take to make even the smallest improvement in this very hand-to-mouth kind of life we live? And Stigner, I think, was upset with what the people were doing in the 60s is trying to be the reformers. And I think he needs to speak to us. The whole way in which the region, both past and present, is pushed between the covers of one book, along with the attitudes both Victorian and contemporary, and both East and West. Yes, it's the most important and ambitious book I have done, and maybe technically the most expert. Just by plain brute force, I had to do it because it was hard to do. Now, he said that after Angle Repose. I don't know whether he would have said it after Crossing to Safety. I have the same uh, identification. As a retired academic, Crossing to Safety is just a marvelous book. And by the way, same sorts of things. He does Turner's Wisconsin when he, in fact, is dealing with that novel. And he was, of course, there. So to sum up. Angle reposes greatness, these five things, a work of history, a first-rate treatment of character, for its descriptions, it's a woman's novel, and it's a book about marriages and angles of repose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see. So I'm going to encourage everybody who's watching, uh, please put in your comments and, you know, into and questions into the chat or the Q&A. Ideally, I uh, pass on what you have to say instead of struggling vainly to come up with questions of my own. Um, however, actually, I'm actually going to start with a, perhaps a, a, I hope this is an offbeat query. What does um, Angle of Repose have to offer for readers who aren't Americans? That is, there's a great deal of the, the great American novel assumes the great American audience. But, you know, what, what do you say about it when you, know, you have a student who's come in, shall we say, from someplace else? And it, what do you want to say to them about its uh, qualities that, that attract other than being a great American novel, or how does it speak to other uh, literatures? Just to throw that out. I, I'd be willing to start with that one. I, I think, um, especially in your in your example of like, for example, a student coming to the U.S. and wanting to read a book. I, I think, um, you know, we we kind of see this this attempt to make sense out of a new place. You know, it's it's kind of like it, it is a story about making sense out of a new place and and trying to find ways to be at home when you are you know your your senses are all off. You know, you don't you, you lack the color green, for example. Um, uh, though that's that's one of the things he talked about with the West. But you know, just this this uh, this intense experience of being unsettled, feeling like you're in exile feeling like you are uh, outside of your place. I think, um, especially people that were, um, that would be coming to the US from other countries, I think would identify very strongly with, with Susan's um, process of moving across the West. So, um, you know, maybe if people reading at home, uh, you know, if they, you know, say the Italian person reading in Italy, and actually I think it was translated into Italian fairly early, um, uh, maybe not, that theme would be, that theme might not be the one to highlight, but um, I'll just leave it at that point. I could answer Other that. professors want to answer? Yeah, well, I, I could answer in that uh, the, the American, so off, American section that so often people are in love with is that old West. And uh, there, uh, if you go to London, if you go to Paris and you go to Germany, they have or organizations that celebrate the old West. It's the John Wayne kind of West. And I think if you gave them Angle Repose, they would see a complex American story that brings together the East and the West and the influence of the East on the West and that the West is not the John Wayne story. It's much more complex than that. So it would give you a larger story and a new story for the foreign student. Well, and I think I want to piggyback on Dick's comment about this as a novel of marriage and a novel about marriage. The last lines that I've been kind of mulling over these last few days as I've revisited this book 
do theorize angle of repose in a much more general sense than, than we think about in terms of the Western um, geography and history. And it talks about it as a kind of marriage metaphor. Um, and he says, um, um, some intersection, um, sorry, um, something in my brain tells me it is the angle at which two lines prop each other up, the leaning together from the vertical, which produces the false arch. For lack of a keystone, the false arch may be as much as one can expect in this life. Only the very lucky discover the keystone. So that he's changing it from it, what it really means in terms of sort of the, the sloping, um, you know, material reasons or, or definition to this other definition of like a, of a, an art that doesn't, is missing a keystone. Yeah. So I think as a metaphor for a, a kind of marriage that wasn't hundred percent satisfying for these people, it's a much broader, um, you know, transnational kind of metaphor. That's not mm -hmm. just about the West. I have a question, which I'm going to expand on. Uh, John Wormuth, which Stegner should I read first? I'm 93, um, so one was a short and concise answer to that, I think. But I have to, I, I will add to that, what other novels, which was he responding to, should one read to get a proper sense of the context for Angle of Repose? So first, which Stegner should you read first? And then which other previous novels let's say particularly about the American West, should one read to understand where he was coming in? Well, if, he, if, he's, if he's emphasizing his being 93 years old, it ought to be Crossing to Safety. That's a wonderful novel about senior people and lifetime friendships. That is a wonderful novel. I agree. And I think The Spectator Bird would also be a good choice. I haven't read that one in a while, but that, that could be a good one to start with. Grouchy old man in there. <laughs> 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 when I was working on the, the the book that I wrote about Stegner, I actually I had a chance to read in the archives and I read every single piece of fan mail that he kept and I put it into a spreadsheet and kept track of themes and, and things like that. And, uh, and, and it was really interesting. Um, he did have a few older folks of writing him letters and saying, um, you know, some of them really poignant. I mean, I think there was one lady who was in a, a nursing home and kind of got the sense that she didn't have anyone to talk to about books and so she just found this really deep companionship with uh Stegner's older narrators and so it, it's interesting the um the book that came before Spectator Bird is called All the Little Live Things and it's the same narr uh, same narrator in both books uh what I, what I find interesting about that is that Stegner um imagined himself into the role of a narrator who was about a decade older than he was so it's kind of you know not the norm I would expect that people are imagining themselves into older positions than they are. Um, but he, uh, so I think he, and I, I guess I'll just reiterate the theme I was trying to get at it with Angle Repose too, is just that, you know, I think he did have this deep sense of, um, you know, I have so much to give to this next generation, but they don't want it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, I, I felt really, moved by um how many people would write to him and say you 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 put into words into beautiful words and help me make sense out of this this loss that i have you um, ever feel that way uh, um, matt as a teacher <laughs> you have so much to give <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it does cross the mind every once in a while <laughs> so, i like your he, second uh, question oh sorry keep going go ahead Oh, I was just going to say, but yeah, he, he did get a lot of um, letters from older folks that were that were deeply appreciative of, of, of the work that he had done in trying to help them make sense of their experiences. So, so Crossing to Safety, Spectator Bird, All Little Live Things, all three of those are really good in that regard. Yeah, and I was just going to take a quick stab at David's, I think, more challenging question, which is how would you contextualize this within a broader American literary tradition? And I think I would want to um, think about it as a kind of counter frontier story story or a more complex frontier, similar to what Dick was saying about it as challenging that Frederick Jackson Turner, yes. you know, significance of the frontier, uh, the frontier thesis that held sway in history for decades, right, before people started to kind of trouble it a little bit. And so I think for me, part of that would be to put this in conversation with um, indigenous writers who have a very different take on what the frontier and the kind of settlement of the West meant to them and a, a very different sense of whose home was at stake in that, that history as well. Um, so I teach, for example, Zikala Shah, who was a writer, a Lakota writer in the early 20th century publishing in um, uh, 
mainstream magazines, often for women, white women writers or readers rather in at the Atlantic and Harper's and these journals that are still around today. Um, and then her, her stories were compiled, um, her autobiographical stories were compiled in American Indian stories in I think 1921. So in addition to, to people like Willa Cather, who I think reads really well alongside Stegner, um, I would say, you know, someone like Zakala Shah, who's um, talking about the West in very comparable ways in many ways, but kind of troubling who's, whose West it is and whose history, um, how the different histories might come together in some kind of national story, right? Um, in terms of thinking about the frontier and the different ways that, that registers to different groups of people. Any uh, further uh, responses to that query? All right, uh, an anonymous attendee then. Um, well, how would you describe Stegner's style of writing? And then, you know, and then who are the authors who may have influenced him stylistically? And I, I think this is style as, let us say this is a separate question from subject matter. It's, it's interesting that he, he really had a high regard for Faulkner. I know that he, he spoke highly of Faulkner many times, but he, I don't really think of him and Faulkner as being too similar. So I think, um, I think he had a lot of respect for him, even though he didn't really uh, take on the similar styles as Faulkner. I, I know that he, uh, he spoke highly of um, uh, a lot of European writers like Chekhov and Conrad. Um, I, I actually just recently read Kristen Lavin's Daughter uh, by Sigrid Unset, and, and I was really curious to know whether she would have influenced him because uh, I thought, um, yeah, just huge overlap with that book. I was um, too late, is after I'd gone to the archives, so I couldn't check to see if he'd actually ever read Sigrid um, Unset or not, but uh, I think he, he, I know that he, when he would write to people that had gone through the Stanford creative writing program, I think he, he liked to tell people that he was, he was a quieter writer. You know, he didn't want to, um, he contrasted himself with Flannery O'Connor, who has this famous line about when I'm talking to hard of hearing, I shout, I, when I'm talking to people that can't see what I need them to see, I write in large letters. And he reacted very strongly against that. You know, I want to speak to people who are willing to listen at the softer registers to, uh, you know, to um, hear the, the deeper resonances, you know, things like that. So um, I think I'm still talking a little bit more about content than style though. <laughs> I think uh, that's a hard question to answer because I, I, I would find it very difficult to pick a writer or two that uh, Stegner was influenced by their style. And if you think about the people that would have been maybe uh, when he was going to college at the Uni University of Utah, and if people like Hemingway and Faulkner and Dos Passos were, were up, he doesn't seem to be uh, talking about them. And he didn't later either. And so I think it'd be very difficult to say, this is the person or these are the persons whose style influenced him. Well, how about the, if, if, if I'm not misremembering this, you know, the whole bricolage, the using of uh, sources as part of your own style. That is, am, am I misremembering this? This is the bit where the, the, what, the uh, letters that he uses are partly taken from another actual uh, all, real person from the 19th century. Right, Mary Halleck Foote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have some well, drawings if you want to see some of her woodcut prints that they were published um, in many places, but alongside my old article, there's some prints that, that she did and I'll just hold them up in case people want to see. But yeah, so she was also a writer and artist um, that Susan's life is modeled on very closely. In fact, Stegner got in a little bit of trouble for excerpting some of Halleck Foote's work verbatim without attribution so um, he, he, he was a person who drew a lot on factual information to write fiction mm -hmm. and if you accused him of being a plagiarizer as some people have he plagiarized his own life more than anything else and Big Rock Candy Mountain is a lot of Stegner uh, recapitulation is a lot of Stegner uh, crossing to safety has a lot of his own family and other people's families uh, Joe Hill uh, 
about the labor radical. It was full of facts. I one time asked him, did he like that? He said, oh, yes, that's the way I start. He said, I, can't, I couldn't think of imagining in a book just for my own. I use sources that I write from. So he did that on his own life, especially. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think a lot of epistolary novels that I know of are much more recent, so they wouldn't have influenced him, but I see that as a big trend right now. I teach a lot of environmental writing and sort of climate change fiction. And there are a lot that are told in this letter or diary or sort of found text um, form. So it's an interesting way to think about time. These are usually letters um, from a future moment, right? So thinking about Stegner is drawing on these letters from the past and what that teaches us about the sort of continuity of past, present, and future is something I'd like to think more about. Um, but I'm not sure about his sort of influences and antecedents in terms of that letter or fragmentary form, other than that it makes me think about history as, again, this kind of fragmentary or fragmentary um, thing that we cobble together from remnants, basically. Well, actually, it's all, oh, sorry, go on. Well, just one more thought on uh, connections to other writers. I think um, as, as he got older, I think, it seemed, it, I would at least argue that it seemed like uh, Wendell Berry might have had the greatest influence on him yeah. as engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, um, has a lot, lot to do with content, I would say, uh, you know, that they were both interested in three generational stories that take place in the same place, or, well, I guess Stegner's didn't always take same place, take place in the same place. But, um, you know, the, the similar set of themes, you know, deep, deep focus on marriage and fidelity and um, what enables people to stick together or not. Um, and then I think, I think his respect for Barry continued to grow over the course of their um, yeah, friendship. Yeah. And so yeah, I think, yeah. uh, well, we were just talking before this about that. Uh, I think Stegner wanted Barry to um, come and teach at Stanford. This is after Barry had moved back to Kentucky and was fairly settled in Kentucky and Barry said no. And Stegner thought he was crazy. Um, and, then, and then there's this really uh, uh, nice letter that, that Stegner writes after Barry had kind of um, been able to survive in Kentucky as a, as a writer. You know, he, I think Stegner thought he was basically just gonna never be heard from again. But um, after Barry had managed to carve out the place that he had for himself in Kentucky, he you know, said, you were right. I was wrong and um, I'm very happy that you did what you needed to do and didn't come to Stanford. <laughs> two, two quick points. Stegner never really cottoned that much to the Stanford area. Notice where he gave his papers. He gave them to Utah, not to Stanford. Secondly, he was not going to retire <laughs> in California, although they did stay. He was going to retire to Santa Fe where he unfortunately died in a, in a car wreck. So he, he, he didn't cotton to that urban California. He was still a kind of Utah rural West person. Hmm. I'm going to have a question then about teaching it. And, and how shall, when you teach students from the West and how shall I put it, students whose lives, whose family lives are particularly reflected you know, in what he's writing about, you know, what is the response? How much of this is, oh yes, of course, how much of it is a revelation? How much of it aids in self-discovery? I guess we could make that about students anywhere, but I'm going to presume that all of you have come across at least one student from the West saying, oh my gosh, this is so great and it speaks to me. Well, David, the largest problem when, and I used it three or four times in class, was the length of the book mm. that students had difficulty. In the same way, I had trouble when I wanted to sign a, the best biography of Abraham Lincoln. The students didn't want to go through a five or 600 page book. And so that was a difficult thing that you weren't getting the full impact of the book because they were turning the pages so rapidly to try to get through those 600 <laughs> pages. And that was too bad. Uh, I think you could get more of Stigner in two or three of those short stories. Uh, and, and I'd like to do Anglo Post. I'd like to have everybody read it because it's so full of good stuff. But it didn't work very well in class because it was just too long and complex for most students. Yeah, as I said, I haven't been brave enough to assign it. But, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll teach some of his shorter essays often alongside something like A River Runs Through It, which Stegner has also written. 
about in essay form. So um, we get, yeah, we get into a sense of place and that the, the sort of living dry and some of the essays um, that are much shorter and easy to digest. But I think that it might be kind of, uh, his insights are less surprising to my students, my sort of homegrown West students, I would say. And some maybe more um, striking to somebody like me who's, this is new, right? Or it was new when I, when I moved to the West. Um, David so I there. identified with that. I was at the aunt from Iowa. who's like, oh, this landscape looks just like, you know, this other one from Iowa. And you try to measure, you know, these new huge Western landscapes to something, you know, but it, you just, right. you know, that it doesn't quite match up. Right. And so he, he has a kind of light mockery of, um, I think it's an ant or somebody in one of the essays. Anyway, so as a kind of outsider, I think these are even more, even more insightful in some ways. In the, in the, uh, uh, potpourri of, of things he did in Wolf Willow, he had about three stories. And if you go to those stories, you'll get most of what Stegner had to say in Angry Post and, and what he had to say, and they were set in Canada, and but the difficulties of land and landscape and the old West and, and the difficulties of moving past that, they are there in those stories, especially a story called Genesis. And it's a wonderful example of, of Stegner. I, I've not taught Stegner with uh, students, but I actually did have the chance to read um, Angle of Repose with a group of uh, people at a, in a reading and discussion group that was sponsored by Humanities New York. So it was, uh, it was when I was in, in Syracuse. And uh, we had, I'd say, I think we had about 18 to 20 people. It was a Pulitzer Prize series, and it was one of about six that we read together. And, and it was really interesting, I think, um, the, the crowd tended to be, I think there were mostly women in their 50s to 70s or so that were part of the book discussion. And um, they were really harsh on Susan. It was, it was, it was really, that was one thing I remember was that they were, they just did not uh, care for her snobbery, I guess was probably one of the themes. But then um, I think a lot of them really connected very deeply with the, the themes of marriage and, and friendship, you know, and, and uh, a decades long relationship and what it takes to maintain something like that over time. And, and so those are, those are some of the things I, my, my experience of the book is this is definitely a book that I think needs to be read over, you know, like the course of a couple of weeks or a month, you know, it's like, it just has the pacing of it, I think rewards, you know, you know, like you don't want to read more than one, one of the places at a time. So it has the, you know, new Almaden and then Santa Cruz, you know, these, these places, that organize the book uh, structurally. Seems like you don't want to read more than one of those. You, know, you kind of want to let the book sit for a minute and then travel on to the next place with the with the characters. Um, so it, it, I don't think it necessarily is easy to facilitate it in the classroom, but. It would work right. well for like a major author's seminar, right? That was just yeah. about yeah. Yeah. his work and less well in like a- For survey. advanced students. What, what's yeah. that? Yeah, for advanced yeah. students. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, actually, then, all right, so I will sort of, I guess, broaden this upwards. I mean, when did, remind me, when did the three of you each first read Stegner? And in effect, if we're, we, we need to talk about should students be reading him, you know, just, you know, in, in the basic surveys, but, you know, sh what, should American literature professors, American studies professors, should they be reading him? When should they read him? Is this the sort of thing where too many people are ignorant of him in graduate school? And how do we make sure, in effect, the teachers know about him so to be able to pass him along to the students? That's an interesting question. I mean, I was introduced to this novel by my dissertation committee at the University of Washington as part of my reading list, my PhD exams reading list. This was something that I was writing a book about nostalgia or a dissertation about nostalgia that became my first book. And they knew I was interested in the West and environmental literature. And so the, I was told about this one um, by my educators. I don't know. I mean, I would certainly recommend it. I don't supervise doctoral students, but it would definitely be on my short list, as I said earlier, of things that you must read about the West. And I guess, depending on, um, who I would be recommending it to, it, it could happen sooner or later in their, their professional career. But yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned I was introduced first to Crossing to Safety just by my husband. I think he was 
using it to court me, both as a <laughs> graduate student, like wanting to be a professor and, you know, stories of marriage. It was not very subtle. He wasn't um, very good at being subtle early on, but um, so it was part of that. <laughs> um, yeah. So sort of serendipity, but then also as a park ranger, obviously learning about the wilderness letter and his, his writing about public lands, I think was pertinent in those circles too, along with Edward Abbey and all sorts of other um, people and, I was introduced to through that agency. By the way, I don't want to interrupt other people, but I just want to add that yeah. there was a uh, question from Kopf to panelists, compare okay. Stegner with Edward Abbey oh. as novelist <laughs> and nonfiction writer. Abbey is for me, the great writer of the American West. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt other people who wanted to answer th that previous question. If you wanted to maybe jump in and also talk about Abbey. Well, by the way, uh, Abbey didn't like Stegner, even though Abbey had been <laughs> down there. Uh, he, and Abbey had a different personality. Stegner was a traditionalist and Abbey was a tradition breaker. And I think it had to do with their personality more than their ideas being different. Abbey thumbed his nose at tradition. Stegner held on to tradition. And uh, there was a very much a break in that sort of uh, situation. Uh, it not always happened. I mean, Wendell Berry showed as an example of another environmentalist who was very much drawn to Stegner. But in this case, uh, the, the two personalities were really different. They're both very good writers about the Western environment, but their personalities clashed. I mean, Abby's such a sort of misanthrope, right? And Stegner strikes me as someone who really loves other humans and like wants us to care about each other as well. Abby's so grumpy. So it's interesting to think about the two of them uh, together. I, I would, wouldn't want to have to choose. I, I think I, again, like I want to embrace the richness of all of these voices. I think they're both really important in writing about the West. Yeah, I, I, um, I think one of the things that um, I remember when, because Abby was a briefly at Stanford and, and they, they clashed, but I think one thing that separated his clash with Abby with uh, his clash from Kesey, at least, was that um, I think he respected Abby's work ethic. So at least they like, you know, they, that's right. they were able that's right. to, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, bond over at least Same that. with McMurtry, uh, Matt. He, he, he really, he didn't have the same point of view as McMurtry, but he said they used their talents and that was really important to Stegner. Yeah. I, I can speak to uh, my introduction to Stegner. It's actually, Jen, it's funny. I'm, um, I'm also, I'm not from Virginia, but uh, your northern neighbor, Maryland. So oh, yeah. I, uh, I grew up on the East Coast. Um, my first experience of the West was also in the national parks of Wyoming. So it's kind of also funny, yes. but, um, I didn't, I don't think I read Stegner until after, well, the first instance in which I heard of Stegner was that I'd read one of the Berry's essays and I saw one of the essays about Stegner, but that it wasn't very meaningful to me at that point. And then I, ironically enough, another connection to you, Jen, is that my wife read Angle of Repose. She grew up in Idaho. And, and she found it very moving and, and connected with it, um, partly for the same, uh, for the themes that we've been discussing. Um, so she read it first, and then um, it's kind of a unromantic version of getting to your dissertation, but I, uh, I was looking for something to write about, and one of my ideas had failed, and I was actually headed to the archives at UCLA to study um, different idea that I kind of already asked for the funding and I, you know, it, it, but it died basically while I was in the archive, but I still had another week in California and my advice, I was talking with my advisor. She's like, well, you know, you know, Stanford had that really interesting mix of people up in the late sixties. You should check out, see what's at the Stanford papers. And so I actually met Stegner through the archives before I ever read a single one of his books in full. So I had all these letters from students all these articles about him that I just started digging into in the archives. And I, I saw, saw um, the opportunity to, you know, this is a guy that left a very large paper trail. <laughs> and so I was, I, I think partly my interest was that he was, um, he was a person that valued literature and valued literary insight. And, and that was something very meaningful to me at that time. And then the other thing was that he actually left a large historical footprint. So, you know, he, he had a massive paper trail. He, you know, he's involved in the conservation efforts and things like that. So, so he's, he's someone that was uh, historically significant, but trying to reckon with uh, the meaning and value of literature and what 
how that shapes people's lives. So. Yeah, and I should say I also um, taught or taught, I talked about this book um, in relationship to a public humanities, um, Idaho Humanities Council sponsored event that oh. you probably know was funded by the NEH um, about Idaho at 150. Um, and there's a whole extensive list, you probably can't read this, but um, contemporary fiction, Idaho voices, nonfiction, um, pioneer encounters and exploration, which is sort of what I was getting at with, with my question about, or my answer to how I would contextualize this as a kind of frontier or counter frontier um, narrative. And so somebody put together a very extensive sort of curriculum about that features this book. And so um, I talked about it at a library um, with folks in Lewiston. And I just find that kind of public conversation so important. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, you know, the role of a great American novel as helping people think about what holds us together as a country. And I think in our contemporary moment where people feel so divided all the time and our political discourse is so polarized all the time and to get together with community members around a state like Idaho, which is quite mixed, um, is really fun and it, it can generate some really important conversations. So that was another um, opportunity beyond teaching it in a seminar class, right? With my English majors, I found that kind of conversation with folks in my state to be um, really insightful. Thank you. I'm going to say it's oh, it's 227. That means that we are approaching our conclusion. And therefore, I'm going to put you all on the spot. If you could perhaps give a one minute, you know, summary, last words, thoughts, and then I will just sort of wrap up. So I'm, well, let's do this in reverse order this time, just for fun. Uh, Professor Etelaine first then. Okay. Uh, I think Jen just gave a very good example of probably where Stigner has probably hit the main interest, and that's for humanities groups and people, say, who are in their 40 to, to 80 group, because I think they bring to that some understandings about marriage and about experience over time. And I'd like for the college students to be much more interested in it, but really Stigner's uh, points of view about young uh, radicals and reformers maybe might uh, alienate some students. So Stigner, for people who want to ask questions about history and marriage, man, it's gold star. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I made my closing comments just now, but I guess I'll reiterate that, you know, my, my top takeaways from revisiting this with all of you is thinking about um, rootedness in place and personal relationships to place that are individual, but also familial, community oriented, regional and national. And, and it helps me to think about the way those different scales um, intersect with each other and maybe where some of the breakage points are. Um, and I think Stegner's novel is, is amazing at that. And I'll just pose that question I ended with earlier, what kind of ancestor do we wanna be? And I think Lyman is, is struggling with that question himself and it's something that all Americans should be thinking about both who did we inherit our country from and what, how do we, um, relate to that past and that sense of history, but then also looking forward. How do I, how do I use what I've learned to kind of be a better ancestor? Yeah, no, and um, picking up on some of those themes, uh, one of the phrases that I really love from the book is uh, it comes from um, a moment where uh, Stegner, or sorry, Ward, <laughs> Lyman Ward is working with a prior assistant and she's not very interested in the, in the, the whole thing. And, um, she, he contrasts her approach to his grandmother with what he thought his grandmother might be like as if she was working on it with him. And, she, and he says that he has this phrase, the humanness of face is lost in time. And I think just this, this attempt to say, what is it like to be um, another person? You know, he's, he's working, you know, very sensitively, very wisely and trying to figure out how to experience the world as another person. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, best fiction writers can help us do that. Um, really well and, and grow from it, I think. So, and Stegner's one of them. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've reached the witching hour or 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Gosh, actually, maybe all three of you, for all three of you, maybe earlier than it is for me. Um, look, thank you so much. Uh, and to the audience, thank you so much for coming and listening. I'll just say again, this will be appearing on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. And I must say, we normally say within 24 hours, but one of our tech guys is on vacation. So that might be, there might be a small delay on that. Yeah at most a week, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see about what we can do. But the point is this will appear 
on our, the YouTube channel. We will be having more in our Great American Novel series. Um, I, the, the series is Fractures. I confess I am not immediately remembering the third one, but uh, it will be following up and uh, thematically similar to uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and Wallace Stegner's um, Angle of Repose. Um, so we will be having this, we will be having more. Thank you again to our panelists so very much. Oh yes, and if people have questions for the panelists, send them to me, randall at nas.org, and I'll pass them along. So on that note, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for having us and thanks to everyone.